And it's interesting because if actually you look at neuroscience, the brain understands fear the same way as it does excitement. Welcome to the Small Steps Big Wins podcast. I'm dedicated to helping you take control of your life. Together, we'll explore practical tips, expert advice, and inspiring stories to help you overcome obstacles and achieve your goals. Making small changes is possible and can lead to big results. Are you ready? Let's go do this. Giovanna, this is going to be a lot of fun. You know that, right? <laughs> Uh, yes, I feel it. I can already feel that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I was so excited for this interview because then I got your bio and I'm reading it and I, it's like game on, you know, let's do this. And thank you for having me, Sue. <laughs> and, you know, so where are you located? So actually, currently I'm living in Playa del Carmen, Can um, Mexico. So it just hits out of Cancun, but I'm originally from Toronto, Canada. So I've just been situated here in the nice warmth for the last two years. <laughs> wow. What took you down there? Intuition mostly. Um, also having met a lot of wonderful Mexicans back home in Toronto and getting curious about the place. And I am much of a world traveler, as we'll probably dive deeper into in this interview. <laughs> I needed to add to the list and um, and then loved it. It kind of like took me in and I stayed. And so this has been it until the next step. <laughs> oh my gosh. Where was uh, home before Mexico then? Home is Toronto. Oh, Toronto. Okay. All right. I love that you asked me this because, I mean, I've been traveling for over 12 or 13 years now on okay. and off. So home as in grown and born and raised Toronto, but home has also been Italy. Home has also been Brazil. Home has also been the Middle East. Home has been South America. And now home is Mexico. Wow. So. wow. What are some of your takeaways from being able to be a traveler like that versus being planted in one particular place? Um, yeah, great question. One, adaptation. So how well can we adapt to any environment? And environment includes people, language, food, the actual environment itself, culture, you know, everything in that space. So to learn how to adapt to some of, I would arguably say, some of the poorest environments I've been in to probably some of the most richest environments I've been in has been a huge lesson. And beyond anything, Sue, I absolutely love just observing humans and, you know, reading human behavior. And I think from traveling the world, more than anything, what I've come to realize is at our core, you know, all humans really do want the same things. And I really do think that comes down to wanting to be acknowledged, wanting to feel a sense of belonging, to be respected and, and to be loved and, and to have connection. I think all human beings, regardless of where you come from, are built to connect and born to connect and i think we all want that and when you get past those language barriers and you can start really talking to people on a deeper level you start to realize we're really all the same wow so how did you do that in different cultures to break those language barriers and be able to relate to those people and bring what you know about relationships and communications into somewhere else other than just a north american culture yeah i mean for starters i learned a lot of languages <laughs> <laughs> I bet you did. <laughs> that, was, that was a first. And, you know, being able to actually, even, even if I wasn't necessarily fluent in some of the languages, even just showing that I cared enough to start learning some of the basics and wanting to, you know, integrate myself in their culture, I think goes a really long way. And of course, showing like, oh, I want to try your foods and I want to spend time, you know, learning these dances or this music or whatever it is, it's very true for them. I think that's one of the best ways to to go deeper because people instantly respect you when they see that you're in their space, in their world, and you really care and you want to learn about it. And I think really, as you said earlier, asking like questions that really get beyond the superficial and I don't, I don't care where you are in the world. I'm like, I want to know about you. Tell me, tell me everything. Tell me who you are. Tell me what's important for you. And I think when you can start digging deeper, people also really respect you because it once again shows that you actually care to get to know them, who they are, yeah. their culture, all of those elements. Yeah. So when you showed up in like Italy and Mexico, did you, did you know somebody there in those different places that you travel to? Or did you just plop yourself out like, hey, hello, I'm here. I'm Giovanna. I'm just going to throw myself out there and meet people. And 
Italy, certainly. Actually, it was funny. I'm kind of laughing because I was 19 at the time when I went to Italy and I called gotcha. my mom the first night and I was crying because I was like, I don't know anybody. I don't speak this language. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> you know, so, so what, well, well, how did you wind up there then at 19? Like, why Italy? Why 19? I would say you have a very high risk tolerance. <laughs> I do, actually. Um, I actually went to university, so I went to do an exchange, gotcha. and so I wanted to I wanted to get in touch with the culture. My mother's side is Italian. Mind you, I didn't grow up learning Italian in the home. I actually learned it finally when I lived in Italy, um, but I wanted to, you know, learn more of that element of my mother's culture, so that's why I chose Italy when I went away as an exchange for university. Now, my mother always jokes and says, it's funny because the first two days you were homesick, but she's like, I never heard from you after those two days. So very quickly adapting, once again, going back to the adaptation piece, you know, adapting, already started studying Italian right off the bat, already started meeting people. And I, I really think it's in some sense, survival of the fittest zoo. You know, as I said, we're, we're built to live in communities. We are built to connect. And so I think humans naturally will look for people around them and we will look to, build those sort of relationships because that is what ultimately fulfills us. So I was going out and walking around the residence and just looking for other students and making friends and it was beautiful. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Was there also an element of desire in that as well? You know, because you wanted to be there. Both desire and fear. I would say both for sure. I think, and it's interesting because if actually you look at neuroscience, the brain understands fear the same way as it does excitement the body responds the exact same way. We have the same physiological responses in our body when we're afraid as we are excited. And so I think depending on how you just choose to mentally look at it, you can either be in a state of fear or you can be excited. And I would say really it was, it was the whole spectrum of it that I was afraid, but I was also excited to be meeting new people. And there is fear in meeting new people, but there's also excitement in that, in that experience. And so I think if you can just kind of throw yourself in and trust the process, it can be very yeah. exciting. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. I have never heard that fear is basically the same response as excitement. Sweaty palms, eyes dilating, yeah. like sweating, everything. The body responds the exact same way. Wow, I didn't know that. So if you retrain your brain to just take a fearful situation and build into that instead excitement, then you actually can conquer or at least mitigate some of your fears that you're going to have while you're going into them. And you just say, okay, you look at it as excitement since my body is going to respond the same way. Exactly. Is that kind of what you did? But, I mean, that's, I didn't probably know that consciously at the time. This is what I do with my clients. And, you know, a lot of it is around, I'm not sure if you're familiar with NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. We talk a lot about anchoring as well. And so this is really like anchoring in new states to the body. So for example, if I know that I need to go up and give a speech, I'll give a, a very perfect example. Tony Robbins, many people know who Tony Robbins is. Usually you'll see him running up onto a stage and he's like, ah, <laughs> has anchored in this actual gesture or motion to associate that or condition his body with excitement rather than it being about fear when he's going up to get up on stage. And so now he's like pumped up for the experience as opposed to, you know, afraid and he brings that energy into it. And so we literally can anchor these states into our, into our body and train ourselves and condition ourselves to feel that excitement. Yeah. That, that's good news for people who think that they can't change in areas that they're stuck in that they just can't can't get out of talk a little bit more then about what you do you have a nine key system that's called the connection code how does that tie in uh to what we're talking about yeah brilliant um so nine key my nine key system the connection code essentially really is about teaching people how to have meaningful relationships both in their personal lives so that can be family romantically anybody in your you know of course personal life all the way to your professional life. And this can be the professional relationships, be it with your boss, your managers, your colleagues, or you may be the boss and you're, you've got your team and your employees. And so all of this, essentially, I teach these nine, this nine key system, and it's a system to building conscious communication skills, emotional intelligence, leadership skills, interpersonal relationship and awareness. 
Where that came from, though, was me mixing essentially my communication and, and human rights law background with my holistic health background and then my NLP neurolinguistic programming background and sort of pairing all these worlds together wow. and saying, OK, well, when I had studied communication and human rights law, I started recognizing all the atrocities and the problems in the world internationally move forwards and I went to study holistic health. And it was really about understanding all the problems going on internally from a mental, emotional, physical, and energetic standpoint. And then of course, pairing that with the NLP, which is really just a lot of excellent techniques and you know hypnotherapy and whatnot to be able to go internally into the unconscious and understand what's really going on layers deeper. And so I said, okay, what really is the biggest problem that we face in the world? If we were to really chalk down, what are our problems? I'd say most problems come down to people problems, the relationships we have with other people. And of course, every relationship always starts with ourself. So if you can understand self and what's going on physically, mentally, emotionally, energetically, and then integrate my nine key system, which really is first about having a, a healthy, very conscious relationship with self, but then how do you communicate that with other people? How do you resolve conflicts with other people? How do you talk to other people? You know, how do you build these relationships? How do you get to know other people? But then how do you actually maintain those healthy relationships? How do you resolve some of those conflicts that have been going on? And so my nine key system essentially says, first, let's understand the communication going on internally. And then let's understand how do we communicate that externally? And if we can understand the, our internal world, and then know how to communicate that in our external world. Now, all the suffering, all these people problems, all of the issues that we really go through with our families, with our friends, with our neighbors, with our bosses, with our teens, with our romantic partners, with our kids, with everybody that we experience problems with, now we minimize those. And now suffering doesn't need to be this huge thing where you know, more than anything, I think the biggest suffering we ever have is when it's a relationship. Any type of relationship, that's what hurts us the most because we're built to be in community. And so, you know, when that suffers, then we really suffer. And so if I can just give you this nine key system and say, hey, let's understand self and let's understand now how to communicate with people so we don't have to suffer anymore. I think that's huge. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. That's beautiful. And you answered my question to make sure I understand you correctly, because I could think somebody listening to this could say, well, I don't have a good relationship with myself. And a lot of people don't even have dysfunctional communication, dysfunctional relationships, and don't even realize that it's starting with them themselves. So your your system starts with the person. So mm -hmm. if somebody doesn't understand their self, that's where they you, they start there, and then you're going to build out the self. And even if you do understand yourself, I'm I'm of the mindset that you can always learn something more. You know, there's, you you never know it, everything. You know, nobody ever knows everything. So what I love about what you just said is that you have a global vision and a global perspective on communication, but yet you have developed you've taken everything that you've learned. And you developed it into something to reach each person individually. I love, I love that you said this about the global vision, Sue, because really, if we were to expand out, of course, everything starts on a personal level. But then, you know, even applying this nine key system on a global level, that could show up in our politics, mm -hmm. right? Like even if politicians, lawyers, doctors, you know, everyone working on a, on a grander scale a leadership type of scale, working with people, big influencers in the world, financial industry, if, you know, if they had all of these skills, essentially, we would have, I think, a very different political discourse. We'd have very different relationships on an inter on a national and international level with other countries. Would war look the way it does? Would we even necessarily mm. need to be having wars? I don't know. I think it's up for debate and discussion. But I think the first place to start is how about integrating some of these, you know, communication and emotional intelligence skills into some of the most important areas where we've got leaders 
that really do need to know how to lead with these like quintessential skills. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Could you touch on a couple of the skills that are in your program for those yeah. who are curious? Yeah, certainly. So I, I love that you said for those who are curious because literally <laughs> the first one is curiosity. We need to get curious first and foremost about ourselves to understand what's going on on all levels. What do we want? What do we desire? What are our boundaries? What are we thinking? What are we feeling? How does that impact our behavior? And when we start asking ourselves these questions, now we become more conscious and more aware of what we're doing. And then that translates into other people. You know, I think a lot of the reasons why there's problems or we suffer is because we're not asking other people, what were you thinking? How do you mm -hmm. feel? How did that thing I did make you feel? Why do you believe that you took that action? And now in being able to actually ask these quality questions and getting curious, we build understanding. And so in building understanding, now we can have more compassion and empathy for people. And that, of course, then allows for more flexibility and adaptability with people, which is another element. It's another key in my system of, you know, are we fully flexible? Are we one empathetic and compassionate and understanding? But then furthermore, are we flexible in terms of actually listening? You know, we may not necessarily agree with what somebody has to say. We may not agree with their, you know, their political view or their opinion about something, but we could at least be open enough to listening, to hearing another side of something, to seeing a different angle or a different perspective on something. That way we can move forwards trying to find solutions or truth together as opposed to finding more and more division, as I do believe is really happening yeah. very much in this world today. Yeah, one of the things that you mentioned that I really like about your program is that it challenges people to look outside of themselves because how much do you find in working with people that a lot of communication is just, you have two people talking, but it's really only one-sided. The more first person's talking and they only hear what they wanna hear and then the other person's talking and they only hear what they wanna hear, but the neither are listening. And do you define the difference between uh, listening and hearing? I believe there's a difference, yes. <laughs> there is. I love that. You, I love that you brought that up. Um, I mean, I really dig into what I simply say is active listening. And this is actually part of a another piece of the keys that I teach, which is called I call it flow. But inside of a conversation that flows, that has a fluidity, a smoothness and naturalness to it, we do need to be actively listening. And that's not just, as you said, hearing, you know, one message coming in one ear and going out the other. It really is about being present and taking in what people have to say. And if you don't understand or if there is confusion or room for doubt, then that's when quality questioning comes into play. And then you start asking and you peel back the layers of that onion and say, OK, what's underneath that? And then, you know, once again, listening, actively listening, being fully present. OK, asking more what's underneath that. And so now you're really getting to the core of a human being and the way they think, the way they feel, and the way they act. And I think when we can understand someone on that deep, deep level, once again, is when we build understanding. And once again, is when we remove some of that judgment that we have for people, and we start opening ourselves up a little bit more to alternative ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. Yes, it sounds like your program also challenges the beliefs and thought patterns as well to view communication a little bit differently than maybe what we what we're used to or what we've been taught or what we've experienced. Um, in your research with working with people, what do you observe that are some of the easiest habits or skills that people change or can change with respect to having healthy relationships? And what are some of the hardest things you found for people to change? Easiest things for them to change and hardest things for them to change, correct? Yes, correct. Okay. Easiest things for someone to change, I would arguably say, is something that's more measurable. So, for example, it's easier for me to say, I want you to, you know, exercise daily for 30 minutes to an hour. I want you to meditate every morning when you wake up, 15 to 30 minutes. Now, you, some people might say, oh, wow, that actually sounds really difficult. <laughs> However, at least those are more measurable. And you might ask me, okay, what does meditating and exercise have to even do with communication? And I would say at its core is when we can be in a good state, and so our emotional states 
are impacted by our physical state and of course by what's neurochemically going on in our body. In other words, the moment I go out and exercise, now I've got, you know, um, adrenaline moving through my body. I've got dopamine moving through my body. You know, we could maybe say there's some serotonin elements in there. All of that is going to make me feel great by the end of my exercise. Now, all of that feeling emotionally is going to show up in how I communicate with every single human being throughout the rest of my day. Same with meditation. If meditation or some sort of breath work practice can put me in a state of peace or a state of calmness or can give me the energy I need to start my day, all of that, like a butterfly effect, impacts and shows up and influences the types of conversations that we're having with everybody else. So arguably, going back to your question, I would say some of the easiest things to implement are you know, things of this nature where it's very measurable, right? An hour of exercise a day, 30 minutes of meditation a day. What is challenging? <laughs> starting is challenging. <laughs> starting anything, True. starting anything is, I would say, is more challenging because people are not yet familiar. So once you've built the habit, once you've actually started and like maintained that habit for a certain number of time, now it actually becomes your normal. And so, for example, for me, if I go a day without exercising, I actually feel like something's off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm become so natural and habitual. Whereas the beginning of starting anything, it's really about getting over that hump. Where I would also add to this something that is difficult are the areas that feel less measurable. And so that, for example, could be, let's say a couple that is going through, you know, problems in their relationship. And I'm offering them different different things to implement into their relationship, different exercises and practices and activities. Some of those are far more measurable. Some of them really just require a huge degree of awareness on your end every single day to check in with yourself mm. and see, how am I showing up? And so something I do that really can help people, Sue, is I get them to put timers on their phone three or four times a day. And the timer sets off and it says, what am I thinking and feeling right now? Or what am I making important in my life in this very moment? And so that forces people to become aware, to sort of come back to the present moment rather than being sort of on robotic mode. Mm -hmm. They are coming back and saying, oh, okay, what am I doing right now? Is it meaningful? What is the conversation I'm having? It, you know, are my thoughts and my feelings in a good place? Are they not? Why are they not? What can I do to change this? So now it forces awareness. But if we don't actually do these things to jog us back into, you know, the present moment to really make us aware, then I think some of those habits can be harder for people to implement because mm -hmm. building awareness is a is an ongoing process. And so if you're having issues, for example, with somebody, you need to be that much more aware of how it is that you're showing up mm -hmm. so that change the way you're talking, the delivery, the words, the tone, everything, your body language, so that now that interaction can start to look very different. And so mm. that might feel a bit harder for some people. <laughs> yeah, I could see that. But I love that you offer practical application, like setting the timer that forces awareness, how much of us just wander through our day, you're not even really conscious about what we're doing. You pick up the phone, you quick check Facebook, or you know, you could you quick get a text, or you're supposed to be working and you open up another tab and you go on Amazon be and look for something. You know, how much of our day is spent in unconscious behavior? So I love the idea of setting the timer in order to force an awareness. And not only that, it's intentional as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not just, it's not just a timer. It's like, oh, a timer went off. You know, it's its like, oh, a timer went off. Where am I right now? How do I feel? And that you're actually giving people actionable things that they can do. So you can, you can measure that in a way. So I'm now even more curious. I go to your website. I sign up. I'm interested in the nine key system. How is that set up for, or how's it structured for my success? Yeah, brilliant. So it's a three month program. And we integrate a combination of, you know, online videos, so do-it-yourself type stuff, plus weekly group gatherings. And so now we're, you know, meeting each other, networking, connecting, talking. And I think there's a lot of, we could use the word healing or helping or moving through things together as a collective, because sometimes 
somebody else's problems that they start sharing, you're like, oh yeah, wow, that's, that's, that's real. That's, that's the same thing for me too. I feel you. <laughs> or, or it brings new awareness that maybe you didn't realize was going on in yourself. So there is that element. And then to add on to that, there's the one-on-one work that I do as well bi-weekly with my clients. So it's sort of a three-tier piece where you're doing it your own with the daily videos, working together, you know, weekly in a group. And then of course, doing the one-on-one work with me because that personal time that we have together too really helps us solidify and get in deeper. Like I said, I'm peeling the onion, getting layers deeper into what's really going on mm-hmm. in your world. And, you know, how can we resolve maybe some of the conflicts going on or how can we help you build some of those meaningful relationships with people? Oh, I love that about your program because you're getting all angles. You're getting the, the, the individual work through the videos where you can absorb that at your own pace. Because I find if I watch videos, I take notes, I rewind them, I go back and listen again, you know, and then the the structured group coaching, that's brilliant as well, because you've got other people that are there for the same reason. So at least it's not just a hodgepodge of people who just like showed up, they actually showed up with intention. So I love that. And then the coaching calls with you. That's a wonderful component, because at least that makes people feel like they're getting to know you more that you hear them, and they're actually working with you to overcome their challenges that they have. Uh, so I uh, thank you for explaining that. I'm- thank you for asking because you know it's it's oftentimes we hear like oh I okay I have an idea of what somebody does but I don't really know what somebody does. So yeah, this is this is really it. <laughs> no, that's okay. It's important to know because I find in the coaching space and I'm around a lot of people who are coaches who become coaches. I work with coaches. It, you know, it's not a one size fits all world. And there are so many different coaches out there for so many different reasons. And it's important that you have that self-awareness and you take that check of who you are, what you need right now, and why you're looking for a coach. And to answer those questions, because if you can't answer those questions, what's going to happen is you're going to go from coach to coach to coach. They're going to cost a lot of money and you're not going to accomplish the goal because you didn't hire the right person in the first place to get you from point point A to point B. Yes. So also excellent marketing on the end of some of these coaches that are out there. (laughs) Yeah. I, you know, I, I'm not a big, I mean, I believe in marketing and everything. And it's, and it's funny. I mean, my funny story is that I searched for over four months to find a coach. I really didn't go into the marketing end of it, like people who were marketing. I just happened to know a lot of coaches. And I've wound up finding my coach by accident because he was a podcaster and he had interviewed somebody who I went looking for their particular interview while he was interviewing them. I'm like, wow wow, he's a really cool guy. I looked into him a little bit more. I got on a call with him, honestly, to ask him on my podcast. And an hour and a half later, I realized, wait a minute, you're a coach. I hired him. (laughs) That's how that happened. Because I I knew what I was looking for. I hadn't found it to that point. And through a casual conversation, I realized, oh, wait a minute, this, he can help me get from point A to point B. I love when that happens, Sue. And I think that's actually the beauty, you know, going back to this one key that I mentioned earlier about flow. And I think when we really can have those natural interactions with people, things really do just start to flow. And everything aligns very beautifully. And also the fact that you are clear. This is another key that I teach about, you know, clarity. If you're not clear about what it is that you want, then you're right. You will jump from one coach to another to another, or you know, one situation or one relationship. How many negative relationships I've mm-hmm. seen people jump from, you know, one to the next to the next? And I say, do you even know what you want? Mm-hmm. Are you clear about what you value in a romantic partner? Because if you're not clear, then you're certainly not gonna get, gonna get it. But you certainly will keep jumping from one person to another and suffer. <laughs> One of the questions I had for you, you know, what hope do you offer for those who have struggled with dysfunctional relationships for a long time? And it sounds like clarity is one thing. Is there anything else you would put into that mix as well? First and foremost, Sue, it's really about removing anything that the body has stored. And so what do I mean by this? Anytime we go through any stressful 
situation or experience in our life, our body stores that stress. And so it could be something as simple as a, as a car accident that was stress right in that very moment, all the way to, you know, a five year or 10 year, you know, relationships that was toxic or a marriage that maybe didn't end very well. And that too is a huge degree of accumulated stress over time that now gets stored in our body. And so going full circle back to what we talked about, about conditioning and anchoring the body, you know, sort of like Tony Robbins does getting up on stage, conditioning himself to get pumped up. Our relationships also condition us to feel a certain way. And so they can condition us to either maybe be more avoidant in our communication style and avoid problems. They can also condition us to become more insecure and anxiously attached in our communication style. And that means we're wanting more and more and more of that security coming from our partner rather than from within ourselves. And so all of these, let's say, new habits or new forms of being get conditioned into our body and that stress and that way of being gets stored in us. And so if somebody were to come to me and say, I just came out of a negative relationship, I would say, let's unpack exactly what is going on like physically energetically emotionally inside of your body and let's understand what stress has been stored let's understand emotionally you know how you're feeling now all the emotions you've accumulated over this time that haven't really been released and how do you actually want to move forwards feeling because oftentimes we say we're not comfortable i'm not happy i'm sad i'm alone i'm depressed I'm angry, whatever it might be. Uh, and many people say to me, I don't want to feel this way anymore. I don't want to feel angry. I don't want to feel sad. I don't want to feel stressed. But really on the other side of that, Sue, is what do you want to feel? And what do you want to create? And what state do you want your body to actually live in from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep? Because if you don't understand that state, once I have clarity, if you're not clear on what it is you wish to feel, and then program that actual feeling into the body. We need to actually be able to experience that feeling in our body. Then it's very hard to move forwards into, let's say, new healthy relationships if we're still holding on to conditions of the past that actually have us feeling like that's the only way things can be. So without going on too much of a rant, you know, a very- No, rant away. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's no restrictions here you can ra i'm just fascinated by the conversation because i've got a thousand questions i'm just waiting for you to like break for a moment because i think this i this has got to be mind-blowing to some people listening i know i'm sitting here just absolutely enthralled about realizing all the negative crap like you know I i'm 51 I've accumulated a lot of stuff over my lifetime, you know, and you're listening to this and realizing, oh my gosh, I have accumulated all this stuff and it's sitting inside of me. And now uh, me personally, I'm like, okay, Giovanna, I need to release these things. What do I do next? You know, I'm just, I'm kind of a, a action oriented person. So, you know, go ahead and go ahead and rant and then answer my question. <laughs> So, I mean, in a very simple example, I was with a client the other day and she had just come out of a relationship and essentially had, I had said to her, you know, we were talking about what is it that she would like to create? And, you know, she was essentially saying, well, I don't know what is a relationship without feeling unheard and mm. unacknowledged and without it really being toxic. And, you know, this term toxic relationships is thrown around a lot. What does that really actually mean? Abusive. We're going to just be very clear. So she doesn't know what non-abusive healthy relationships look like. She doesn't know what it means to actually communicate and not have someone get angry and reactive at her. And so if every single relationship you've walked into, your partner is now reactive and they're angry and they're explosive or the complete opposite. They totally shut down and they close off and they don't communicate with you at all. Are you going to feel safe to ever communicate? No, you've no. been conditioned to say the moment I express myself, 
I'm either going to be faced with anger or faced with someone that shuts down and turns their back away and leaves me. So do you want to be abandoned or, you know, exploded on? No. So you don't express yourself. And now you continue moving through relationships where you don't express and you don't express. And now that becomes your reality and you think that that is normal and that's not normal and not everybody that you will attract into your life is going to be explosive or, you know, shut down either. There are people that are healthy and secure and that can communicate. But if you only believe that that's possible, then your radar is only open to that being possible. And so unprogramming all of that and understanding that there are other, there are other ways. And of course, you being the first person to learn how to read people and detect people and who are the people you're attracting into your life, but then also be vulnerable enough and open enough to really start expressing yourself again and really speaking to how it is that you really feel. And that's a process and that's, um, <laughs> I never want to say difficult, but it certainly requires you wanting to make those changes. <laughs> well, yeah, that's your point. If the person wants to make the change, then the change is going to happen regardless, you know, difficult or easy is just a matter of perception, isn't it? So if you really want to change and you want to put in the quote unquote hard work, it's not going to seem hard because you've got that end in mind. You've got a destination you want to get to. And in her case, her destination was, I want to learn how to have healthy relationships that aren't going to be toxic. And so I am uh, would imagine part of your work is helping people rewrite their thoughts and turn them from, you know, I, I, I don't feel heard in my relationship to I am seeking relationships that are healthy and constructive and I feel heard. Is that, is that kind of sums up? Yes. And I love that you say rewrite our thoughts because I'm going to move, I'm going to start backwards and move to thoughts as the first piece. When we are communicating with each other, of course, we're communicating verbally with our words, but there are so many things taking place on an energetics level. You know, what is my body language telling you? What is my energy telling you? What is my tone even telling you? All of that is communicating something to you. And so energetics or what is taking place in the you know body language element of a conversation is sort of like the, the final piece move one step backwards, our emotions are impacting what's coming out. My, our emotions are impacting our presentation. And what impacts the emotions, of course, then is the thoughts. So you mentioned rewriting our thoughts, and I would say certainly an element of that is our thoughts, but even deeper is you know rewiring the feeling, the emotional state, and then that changes how we energetically show up. And that changes our presence and our body language and our tone and our facial expressions and the fluidity of the conversation and all of that. And whether that ends up at, you know, I always say we either end up in a place of deeper connection or we're sort of on neutral or even disconnecting. And so depending on our presence and our energetics that come forward, that in the end, ideally, would lead to deeper forms of connection with the people that we are that we're talking with, be it a stranger and be it, you know, someone we've known for many, many years in our lives. Communication is not something that is inherent <clears throat> excuse me, inherently natural. And it's mm -hmm. definitely something not taught. So what are your thoughts on childhood? You know, that they say that zero to eight most of the issues that we have as adults can actually be traced back to that time frame in our lives. Do you bring that into what you do or do you, you know, how do you address that or your thoughts on that? Super critical years, of course, they hugely influence us though that time in our lives and speaking to a lot of the work that I will do in my one-on-one -on -one sessions with my clients is going back into the memories that are stored in our unconscious. So like I said earlier, we store stress from the different experiences that we have in our life. And so we have these memories stored in our body and oftentimes we don't know that they're there or we don't realize consciously that they're there until we go inwards and understand that there, there are a lot of memories, there are a lot of emotions and a lot of feelings that we felt in those years 
that have hugely impacted the way we think, see, and you know, behave about certain things. Of course, I know, you know, psychology says those are the most impactful years. I would arguably say teenage years are extremely impactful too. And, you know, that could be all the way up until 18 that, and e even still, you know, kids going away to university and processing all these things and still not really understanding, you know, like I don't really feel like I had a solid grasp or, or you know, a, a self-assurance as an adult until probably I was over 24, 25 and really started oh, yeah. actually. Yeah, I was gonna say, who knows what they wanna be at 17? Like, that's just so ludicrous, honestly, yeah. to yeah. send somebody to college, university and say, okay, you're 17, 18 years old, pick the profession that you're gonna do for the rest of your life. How stupid is that? I mean, honestly, if you don't even know who you are and you're coming out of the teenage years, yeah. How does how does that serve anybody at all, really? And and so for you know for those of us who have had those childhoods that are just less than stellar, there is hope for people. Then if you are in you know if you've had that quote unquote traumatic childhood, and trauma is different to everybody. So I'm not going to go into the definition of trauma. I mean, what's traumatic to one person may not be traumatic to another, and there's varying degrees. But you know, let's call it for what it's worth. You know, if it maps on you as a traumatic childhood then what you're saying is there is hope for people to change, to help their relationships, to move forward and to, you know, have a more positive and fulfilling life. Certainly. And what I wanted to say to that, Sue, is I think we, you know, we use this word trauma and imagine, oh, they must have come from like this really heavy, maybe abusive family or devastating life or poverty or drugs and, you know, crime. And, you know, we assume like these crazy sort of childhood upbringings, whereas I would say you could have come from, let's say, a middle class family. But if you had parents that were living with a financial scarcity mindset, you mm -hmm. may have always thought you were poor and needed to hold your money. And so that's going to stay with you into your adulthood until you start working through it and clean it up. Or, you know, if you've had, for example, as a child, a memory of your mom walking away into the other aisle when you're in the supermarket and maybe she didn't come back for a few minutes, that could, you know, register in the body as a child as abandonment. And on some level that could create anxiety and, you know, mm -hmm. this anxious attached sort of style of that can come in our relationships later. There can be moments that can happen in our childhood that we don't even, we wouldn't necessarily consider to be anything crazy or traumatic. And yet our, our mind can register that. And emotionally we can feel that as something traumatic or scary or fearful. And then that shows up in our behavior as adults. And so going in and do, doing the deeper layered work with a, a coach one-on-one, -on -one, I think is what's so powerful because then that starts to pull things to the surface. And when we then become conscious, that's when we can start making changes in our, in our behavior. And that's when we can start having conversations in our relationships that say, I behaved this way because it actually reminded me of a time in my childhood when, or because it triggered this moment or this memory when, and it's not an excuse, but it's just for that person to understand why you mm -hmm. are responding or reacting the way you are. So maybe, mm -hmm. maybe somebody learned to always shut down as a child because that kept them safe because maybe they had a parent that was always aggressive or angry. And so they shut off. And so now they're coming into a romantic relationship, shutting off. And so for you to even understand, so for the person to understand why they're shutting off is the first step. And then to be able to communicate to that, that to their partner and say, okay, I'm recognizing that by you speaking to me in this way, it's triggering me because it reminds me of how my father spoke to me as a child. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's something here I need to work on. It's not about you. It's actually about dad. Let me go and work on this over here. And but by being able to communicate that to your partner, then the partner recognizes, OK, this is actually your shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not mine. Yeah. yeah. Do a different job communicating, you know, yeah. maybe you deliver it differently. But right. now it's sort of the two worlds and the two dynamics coming together to learn how to communicate in a better way with each other.
Oh, okay. Well, that makes more sense. So without giving away all the tools in your toolbox, how do you help somebody overcome that so that they don't continue to bring, you know, awareness is the first step, right? To know that something's going on. But how do you help somebody overcome, say, that particular situation so that they don't feel they're going to be abandoned? Yeah. Excellent question, Sue. It's really about changing the emotional state and connection to that piece. And so it would look like, and there are there are various techniques to minimize, essentially, in very simplistic mm-hmm. terms, minimize the feeling over here, the intensity of the feeling over here, amplify the intensity of the new feeling you want to create mm-hmm. over here. And so it's really about, you know, and everything we experience in our life is through our senses. So when I talk about minimizing the experience over here, we want to minimize everything our brain has registered through our senses. So even the colors, the the conversation, the tone of voice, the feeling in the body, the sensation, all of that, that our brain has registered through our senses, we want to minimize that feeling. But then we want to understand once again, what is the feeling we want to actually experience and we want to maximize that. So how would the body respond? How would it feel? What would we be seeing around us? What would we be hearing instead? A lot of this is um, NLP techniques. So you can you know play around with that. Another piece I really like is somatic therapy. And somatic therapy is really about recognizing, once again, what's stored in the body and then lots of physical movement and techniques mm-hmm. to release what's actually physically stored in the body and getting the getting people to actually move around. And once again, like I said, there's different things you can do to physically get them to move or release all that stored energy in the body. So can we do these things on our own to a certain degree? But this is why you hire somebody. <laughs> even so even I myself with this own background, I do a lot of this stuff on myself, but a lot of it also requires a third party to look in and register what's going on while I'm on a deeper, we call it theta states. So when we're meditating, we go into theta states. And so we're sort of that in-between sleep state and awake state where our brain is very easily influenced and we Mm. can reprogram it in that theta state. And so can I do that to myself when I'm meditating or doing breath work? Certainly. However, that's taken, of course, years of my own training. And even still, if I had somebody else, you know, my own coach or therapist doing work on me, they're going to be able to dialogue with me and talk to me while I'm in that beta state and pull out information that I can't pull out myself while I'm in that state. It's just more effective and efficient. So, you know, they even say some of the greatest therapists need therapists. And it's for this reason. They see things that we don't see in our own blind spots. Sure. I love the picture that you paint that, you know, you always you need that third person there. So like a therapist or a coach is a physical mirror Mm. to help you see the things that you can't see for yourself. Humans are fascinating. (laughs) There's a lot going on inside of us on a daily basis, whether we're aware of it or not. We are constantly influencing and impacting each other. And what is the best way that we can do this so that on an international scale, on a national scale, on a family scale, on a like intimate relationship scale, on a personal scale, we can be at a place where we are most fulfilled. And I use the word fulfilled because I don't think it's about, you know, of course, happiness is our day to day choices, but I think fulfillment is more of a long term you know, it's not this instant gratification piece. It's like the choices, every small incremental decision I make today, every conversation I have to build closure and peace and love and connection today is going to lead me to feeling fulfilled, both on a personal level and on a global level. And so I think if we could look at things that way, we'd have a very different planet we'd be living on right now. Yeah, I think so too. I just want to also agree with you on fulfillment versus happiness. I think happiness is one of those words that is just completely overused in our culture. And we see cat, we, you know, we say things like we're searching for happiness, we're searching for the happiness tends to be a bully in the schoolyard where it's going to draw a line, and you're going to come up close to it. And then it's gonna say, Nope, 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 you're not happy yet. You know, and then it's gonna go, it's gonna draw the line again, it's gonna draw the line again. I think fulfillment 
is one of those terms where if you think of the word fulfillment in there is fill. How are you filled daily? What do you fill yourself with? Do you feel fulfilled in fulfillment? And that's just a, a to me personally, I think just a more beautiful picture on how we should approach our life and what we are accomplishing within it. So you just bring such a diverse background. I love it. that, you, And I'm sure all of that is incorporated into your program that you have. I don't believe I mentioned, but I actually have a book coming out at the end of the year. And I so was just going to ask you that. You, you've got to have a book in there. And yeah. if you don't, I was going to tell you, you needed to write one. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the process. It is a journey. <laughs> but the book is is set to come out at the end of the year. And so... That's also a beautiful introduction into all of this that could lead to the program, lead to the events and, you know, bringing us together, not just online, but also in person, too. Oh, beautiful. Well, I'm going to have you back on to talk about your book when that comes out. So I'm excited for that. I can't wait to extend our conversation into that as well. Uh, I always close up podcasts with my core three questions. And so let's roll into that a little bit. And the first one is what question or topic you wish I would have asked about? And how would you have answered that question or expanded on the topic? what question you should have asked me today. Yeah, yeah. Although I feel like we covered all the bases, honestly. (laughs) But maybe to go back full circle. Sure. Why is why is human connection and conscious communication so important? And that that would be the question I would say. And my I guess my answer to that would be everything in life i can't i can't stress it even more everything in life is a relationship everywhere you go from the moment you wake up and you're beside your partner or you're not and you want a partner to you know walking out in the world to standing in the line at the coffee shop or the grocery store to the event that you're going to to networking to you know your boss your employees your colleagues your kids your family everything is a relationship if those are not working, if they're not fluid, if they're not in a good place, if you're feeling totally disconnected, that wears on you. Mm-hmm. And there is only so long that you can live with that wear and tear and that stress and that really it's it's a lack of peace. It's, mm-hmm. you know, people come to me and when they're not at peace, it's always their relationships. Mm-hmm. And of course, once again, relationship with self, do you feel good within your own self? And well, so, we just, oh yeah. God. No, that's, that's just it. That's why I would say, you know, human connection, these nine keys, conscious communication is so important for these reasons. What would you say to the introverts out there who right now are listening and saying, I don't want to talk to anybody, but I know I'm supposed oh, to. This is a good one, Sue. I'm like, this is a bigger thing. I'm sure there's introverts listening because I'm a very outward person. You know, I've got a podcast, so, but I'm also, I also am, you know, I don't always talk to everybody either, but I know there are people who are more introverted and they're like, yeah, my relationships suck. And they put on themselves that, oh, I'm an introvert. So my relationships suck because I'm an introvert. What would you say to the introverts? One, there's not a thing as like extrovert or introvert. We all fall on a spectrum. People fall in different areas of that spectrum. And really the difference, just to clarify introvert versus extrovert, extroverts gain energy from being around people. Introverts recharge their battery. Their energy comes from their alone time. Mm -hmm. All it means is that introverts just need to be clear and intentional about how much time they can give to being on with the world and how much time they just need for themselves. So if it means 60% of their day can be spent full on really engaged, like it, just loving that connection with the person they're with or really present or whatever it may be, then you give your full 100% to that 60% of your day. And the rest of the 40% you spend, you know, re-energizing yourself in your own space in your own time. Some introverts are, pub- some of the greatest public speakers in the world are introverts. They can be on all day. They're out, they're performing, they're sharing, they're educating, they're teaching. All they need is their one hour at the end of the day to meditate, to unwind, to have their own space for themselves, to sort of clean up all of that energy, refuel, go to bed, have a good night's sleep, and they're they're back at being what we would probably consider to be extroverted, you know, work, but, you know, the next day. 
So it's really just a matter for all the introverts listening to this of them checking in and saying, you know, what is my threshold? What are my boundaries? And in that space, you know, whether it's 60% or 80% or 90% of your day can be given to being present and just knowing what you need to recharge your battery, then give yourself that thing you need to recharge in the time that you need. Oh, thank you. Because you just redefined introvert, extrovert, and I didn't understand it that way. So that's the best definition, explanation I've ever heard of introvert versus extrovert. So that helps me tremendously. I will never look at introverts, extroverts the same again. So I appreciate that. Um, Quick book and podcast that have had a significant impact on you. Brene Brown, 110%. This woman has changed my life. Her book, Daring Greatly, uh, and her TED Talk, The Power of Vulnerability, has entirely changed my life. Perfect. As we close, what's one small step that you want to leave us with that we can do today that's going to help change our tomorrow? I always say that you want to be very mindful of how you feel before, during, and after a conversation. And are you feeling energized or are you feeling drained at the end of those interactions? And were you the one that brought energy into the conversation and fueled it? Or are you the one that was the drainer of the conversation? Or did you both fuel each other? Or did you both work to draining each other? Or did you just walk away simply neutral to the whole piece where you could have perhaps offered a little bit of, you know, more light into the experience? But more than anything, it's about being extremely mindful. How am I going into a conversation? How am I feeling during it? How am I feeling after it? And when we have this awareness, now we can see how we are influencing and impacting other people what energy we are leaving with them at the end of the day and how that is influencing the relationships that we have with that person moving forward. Perfect. Love it. Effect. It's a butterfly effect. I leave this energy with you. You're going to pass it on to the next person. So Mm -hmm. we want to be really mindful of what we leave with somebody. I think it's so important. Yeah. I always say I seek to leave someone better in a better position than when I met them. Oh, I love that. I love that. That's exactly what it is, Sue. (laughs) Giovanna, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I love it. How people can reach out to you. I'm going to have all that in the show notes because you gave me a ton of resources and ways for people to connect with you. So it's no use going over all that now. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. I thoroughly enjoyed my time together with you. I look forward to the next time. I want you to come back and talk about your book. Mm, Lots of good stuff to come. Sue, thank you so much for having me and for all of you out there listening feel free to even book a free 30 minute connection call with me i'd love to chat connect and you know go from there with life i you know i'm all about this (laughs) so thank you again sue (laughs) you're welcome thank you for listening to another episode of the small steps big wins podcast i value your time with me and i seek to make every moment count in order to make lasting change in your life listening is usually not enough So I want to ask you, what practical steps are you going to put into action today as a result of listening to this podcast? Remember, any step, any action, no matter how small, starts your journey to a big win. And if you're not sure where to get started, reach out to me and let's have a conversation. Until next time, love yourself, then love others. Peace.